In previous videos, I talked at length about smart home control systems and which ones might be the right choice for your setup. In my opinion, the best of the best is Home Assistant. While it's true that it can be a bit of extra work to set up and configure, I feel that it's a fair trade-off for the huge amount of features and customizability that you get. Today, we'll go over the different methods of installing Home Assistant, and do an install, and then we'll go over some basic configurations to get you started. My name is Steve, and this is IT Alchemy. There are actually quite a few ways to install Home Assistant. I'll go over all of them in order of difficulty. Feel free to choose whichever method you have available to you and what you're comfortable with. If you're just starting out and you have no experience with installing operating systems or working with microcomputers, I recommend going with the first in our list, and that's Home Assistant Green. Home Assistant Green is a plug and play device that is by far the easiest solution to get you up and running because it already has the whole Home Assistant operating system pre-installed. Home Assistant Green has a 1.8 gigahertz quad core ARM processor, four gigabytes of RAM and 32 gigabytes of storage. All you need to do is plug in the power cable using the provided power adapter and connect it to your home network using an ethernet cable. That's it. Then all you need to do is download the mobile app to set it up or navigate to the local URL using a web browser. Home Assistant Green is about a hundred bucks and can be purchased from the Home Assistant website. Another way to get Home Assistant is to use a Raspberry Pi. Raspberry Pi is a powerful and inexpensive microcomputer that can run all kinds of things, including Home Assistant. You'll have to attain a Raspberry Pi and some accessories, as well as image a micro SD card or a solid state drive with the Home Assistant operating system. You can purchase a Raspberry Pi and accessories from the Raspberry Pi site. If you're going this route, I would highly recommend purchasing a kit since they come with everything that you need. Next up is Home Assistant Yellow. This essentially comes with a board and an enclosure, but you'll have to provide a Raspberry Pi compute module. This version is extensible with an M.2 expansion slot for additional storage and an optional PoE port so you can power it from a PoE capable network switch rather than a standard power supply. This version also comes with a built-in radio to connect it to Zigbee devices and is Matterport compatible. Lastly, you can install Home Assistant on other devices and within virtual machines and containers. Since under the hood, Home Assistant runs on Linux, pretty much any generic x86 64-bit machine should work. Keep in mind that these options are for users that have either spare machines sitting around or require specific hardware setups. One thing to note when using a virtual machine or a Docker container, this method can be useful if you want to use an existing computer, uh, and in some ways it can give you more flexibility over the system, but there are, are some limitations in certain cases, particularly where add-ons and auto-updates are involved. For the purposes of this video, we'll install Home Assistant on a Raspberry Pi. I chose to use a Raspberry Pi starter kit from Canakit. While this is a little more expensive, it comes with everything that you need to get started. Here I have the kit that includes a Raspberry Pi 5, which is a 2.4 gigahertz 64-bit quad-core CPU, and this model has eight gigabytes of RAM. Home Assistant is not very resource intensive, so this is a little overkill for running a basic dashboard and a few automations. The kit comes with a 128 gigabyte micro SD card, though you can use your own SD card if you have one. Home Assistant requires 16 gigabytes of storage at a bare minimum, but I would recommend at least 32 for a basic setup. I would also recommend that if you're using a micro SD card, make sure that it's A2 graded. These are designed for hosting applications and can better handle the small but frequent reading and writing that Home Assistant will do to that card. An SD card is enough to get you started, but that card will eventually fail at some point due to the excessive logging that Home Assistant does. So for a more permanent setup, I would recommend that you use a solid state drive instead. The rest of the kit includes a heat sink, a system fan for cooling, a couple of display cables, a micro HDMI to HDMI, the enclosure, a USB-C power supply, and a USB micro SD card reader. The first thing that we need to do is image the SD card with the Home Assistant operating system. For this, you'll need to hop on a computer and download the Raspberry Pi imager, 
Insert the micro SD card into the provided USB micro SD card reader and plug that into your computer. Launch the Imager software and select the type of Raspberry Pi device. In this case, we're using a Raspberry Pi 5. For the operating system, select Other Specific Purpose OS, Home Assistance and Home Automation, Home Assistant, Home Assistant OS. For storage, select the SD card that we plugged in earlier. If you're using the SD card with the Canakit kit, it may already have the Raspberry Pi OS installed, but it's okay to override it. Go ahead and hit Next, and the image will write the Home Assistant OS to the card. Once it's complete, you can unplug the USB micro SD card reader and remove the SD card. The kit is pretty easy to assemble. First, we'll take the enclosure and separate it. There's a base plate, the housing, and a top plate. Take the Raspberry Pi board and angle it slightly and place it on the bottom plate until it seats firmly. It only fits in one way, and you can line up the USB ports on the side with the indentations on the bottom plate to be sure. Next, install the included heatsink. Comes with thermal pads already attached, and you'll note that one of them is a slightly different orientation than the others. Use this as a guide to place that pad down on the Ethernet transceiver shown here. It's also the same orientation on the board. Remove the plastic film from the pads. Place the heat sink on the board. Make sure you line up the pads with each of the chips and then press down firmly. Before we install the housing, locate the fan port next to the GPIO interface and pop the cover. Plug the cooling fan into that port. It'll only plug in one way and make sure that the yellow wire is facing outward from the board. Next, place the housing over the board, lining up the indentations on the USB and Ethernet ports on the rear as well as the USB ports on the side. You'll have to route the cooling fan up through that. Now attach the cooling fan to the top plate with the logo facing you, and then attach the top plate to the housing. Flip the case over and insert the micro SD card that we imaged earlier with the logo facing outwards into the SD slot. Connect the power adapter. An important note here is the Raspberry Pi 5 requires a bit more juice to supply power to its compute module and third-party devices that you may want to attach USB, so make sure to only use the included power supply or an equivalent. After a minute or two, the Raspberry Pi is booted up and you should be able to access Home Assistant. In the browser of another computer, navigate to one of these URLs. You can also use the Home Assistant mobile app. If for some reason you're unable to connect to it, check the Raspberry Pi's IP address. You can download and install an app called Fing on your phone and run that to scan your network. And you should see the Raspberry Pi listed among them or something labeled Home Assistant. If not, you can always plug in one of the display cables to the Raspberry Pi and connect it to a monitor. You can also have to plug in the USB keyboard and mouse and then open up the terminal app, enter ifconfig, and that should show you the IP address. None of that works, it's possible maybe the image didn't write correctly to the SD card, in which case, go ahead and try that step again. Once you get to the main screen, it may display that it's preparing Home Assistant. If you run into issues with this step, I'll link the installation troubleshooting guide in the description. After a short wait, you should see the welcome screen. Since this will be our first setup, go ahead and click on Create My Smart Home. Next, Click on Create User Account and make sure to keep the password safe because it's unrecoverable if you lose it. I recommend keeping your passwords in a password manager and not stored in your web browser. Next, it'll ask you for a location. This will be used to create what's called your home zone. We'll get into more about what zones are later, but essentially this will create a geographic location representing your home and can be used in automations revolving around location. Uh, it also configures settings like units of measurement and time zone. Lastly, it'll ask you about sharing information. You don't need to share anything, but the data is anonymous and it's used to improve the Home Assistant's performance. See, that wasn't so bad, was it? Please help me out, like this video, and subscribe to my channel. Stay tuned for the next video where we'll go over each of the settings in Home Assistant. We'll configure some dashboards, we'll add a few devices, and we'll even add some automations. 
My name is Steve, this is IT Alchemy, and thanks for watching.